Well, hello, Bridge people. My name's Dave, and uh, I've been here before, but if you haven't met me, I uh, pastored in uh, Cincinnati for almost 30 years at a church, and then um, now I just travel around and help churches try to get healthy and keep pastors off tall buildings and ledges <laughs> because of you people. <laughs> anyway, it is fun to be back here and to be back in uh, my home state and uh, my country of origin. United we stand, divided we fall. That is your state motto. How come you're not saying that with me? Anyway, it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. And to take part in this series called On the Mind about mental health issues. I absolutely love the transparency that Vince has been expressing throughout this series. And the problem is complex. As Vince has stated, it's, you know, there can be a mix of whatever, chemistry, physical stuff going on with uh, when we have emotional issues. It can be just the season of suffering. It can be all sorts of different things, our brokenness. Or, as we're going to talk about today, spiritual warfare. So the risk in talking about spiritual warfare is that, and the reality of demonic influence, is that there are two dangerous extremes that we can fall into. The former atheist and then fabulous writer and philosopher C.S. Lewis, Christian author, he wrote in his classic book, The Screwtape Letters, that, that one is to disbelieve in their existence, the other is to believe and to feel an, un, uh, an excessive or unhealthy interest in them. In other words, you can give the enemy too much attention or too little attention, or you can place zero blame or too much blame. For instance, I, I grew up in a little town called Augusta, Kentucky, population 1,200, I think it was back in the day. And uh, my dad got a job at General Electric, which was a big deal because that raised us out of poverty, frankly, and we were hillbilly elegy. My uh, parents had a pretty terrible marriage. It was uh, too much uh, fighting and drinking. And, and, but in their mid to late 40s, they came to know Jesus and were radically transformed, except though they were born again and spirit-filled, they never really dealt with the issues in their marriage, the relational issues there, and the abuse in their familial histories, in their past, and their own baggage. So instead of doing the hard work and dealing with it and maybe working with a counselor or whatever, they just super-spiritualized everything and accused each other of having a demon. So that just kind of laid that out. So... First, let's talk about uh, the reality of spiritual conflict and the oppressive strategies of the enemy. And here's a disclaimer. If you're new to this, someone invited you here today and promised you Cracker Barrel afterwards or something, and uh, you feel tricked, um, it's going to get a little weird today. So come back next week, and Vince will be back up here, and it'll be great, and I'll be gone, and life will be good. What we have in the church, I believe in the Big C Church, is an underdeveloped understanding of the kingdom of God. A kingdom is simply a territory where the king and his servants rule and exert authority and power. So, uh, we now live on a planet where the, the, the uh, God's kingdom, the kingdom of God, which Jesus talked about constantly and actually said that he came to bring and had brought, but not fully culminated yet. The Apostle John uses very, very direct language. He was a follower of Jesus and was the only one of the apostles who was not executed in a grisly death. He was exiled to an island and died of old age. But he writes towards the end of his life, the reason the Son of God appeared, here's the reason, was to destroy the work of the devil. In other words, Jesus came to this planet to confront an enemy. He invaded enemy-occupied territory to, to liberate it. That gives the New Testament stories kind of a, a, a cosmic paradigm, and it puts them in the context of a war. So if you don't get this, I'm telling you your Christianity will get a little, uh, it'll get a little squirrely because it's not always a walk in the park, right? And so when Jesus appeared, there was this clash of kingdoms, the kingdom of God against the kingdom of darkness. Um, and in the same letter then, John writes that this whole world, our whole planet, is in the grip of the evil one, a powerful malevolent force that he calls Satan, which just means, that word just means accuser or adversary. 
who operates kind of like a spiritual mafia illegally. And that's why you see this explosion of power encounters in, in the Gospels of demonic uh, activity and Jesus confronting it because something new has been inaugurated on the planet, right? But the Bible also claims that this enemy that John writes about has actually been defeated, that he was crushed at the cross, and yet not all has come to completion. So about, I think it was 70 years ago, there's a German uh, a Lutheran theologian named Oscar Coleman wrote a great book called Christ in Time. And he said that we live, he uses this for analogy, we live analogously uh, like the time between, in World War II, between D-Day when Nazi Germany was essentially defeated by the Allied forces on the Normandy beaches, D-Day and Victory in Europe Day when they actually surrendered. Do you know how long that time was? It was nearly a year with the highest numbers of casualties of World War II, you know, even with a defeated foe. So we're living spiritually between this time of, a, of D-Day and Victory in Europe Day. Our spiritual D-Day was when God stormed the beaches of this blue planet with a force that uh, had not been seen before, and Jesus was crucified and resurrected, and things change. The kingdom has come. It's an invasive force of power for men and uh, women's hearts. But it is now and not yet, meaning that until he returns in a spectacular event called the second advent, we are at war, and the kingdom of God is here, is now, but not yet. So where the kingdom of God is welcomed and is operating, you can expect a little bit of craziness, frankly. Ba back in the day when, when I was pastoring, we, we invited and attracted a lot of wounded and broken people. We took literally the parable of Jesus. where the, You know the story where the rich man throws a big feast and he, and he invites all his upper crust friends and they all come back with excuses why they can't come. And when his admin assistant comes to him and says, hey, the, no one's coming, everyone has an excuse, he says, wow, you go out in the alleys and the back roads and wherever and compel people to come to my house. I want my house to be full. I want a big party. But that also comes with challenges and, uh, and crazy ones. And the, the church that, we, that I was a part of, it grew and got big and messy. And the only difference between a mega church and a, a, a small church or a regular church is that it's just more problems. So one Saturday night after the service, I came out in the atrium, which was kind of like a food court where people could get food, a, a big area, and uh, people were sitting at their tables eating and trying not to look at a woman who was standing on top of a table leading hymns. We didn't even know any hymns. And so, uh, so I walked up to her and said, uh, excuse me, would you mind stepping down? And she said, no. I said, well, you need to come down because we don't uh, stand on tables here. And uh, she says, it's because I'm a woman, isn't it? And she hit me. And so the police came and dragged her away while she called me explicit names. But it, it, you can expect some uh, weirdness at time. One morning after a service, I was speaking with, a, with someone up on the stage right after the service who wanted to talk about something. And this young guy starts pacing behind me and... He, <laughs> At one point, he reaches behind the back wall, pulls out a fire extinguisher, and hits me with it. So I just wrapped my arms around him and yelled, prayer team! And so they drag him behind the curtain and do whatever they uh, do there. Or once, I was leading worship, and, uh, and uh, the, out the back door, this person, this woman comes running in with a bottle, a plastic bottle of water, and she's spraying people with it, runs down the front aisle, aisle running as fast as she can, runs out the back, and then she's out the door and gone. I thought, well, that's weird. I'm playing. And then all of a sudden, I see an usher open the door, and she came in a second time doing the same thing and ran back out and disappeared. We never saw her again. I thought, well, we've got to train our ushers better here, but this is, this is not working. Then uh, I remember uh, one day this, um, I met a middle-aged man from Columbus, and this is in the middle of the week, who was brought to the church by a friend, and he was concerned about some uh, chronic issue that he was wrestling with and wondered if he could talk to someone in, in town 
uh, somewhat confidentially, and for whatever reason, our church name popped up. So the three of us sat in a little room at the church, and he began to casually share uh, his story with me, and nothing too deep. He was uh, uh, well-dressed, very polite, a successful sales rep. So after about 20 minutes of just hearing his story and listening to things he was struggling with, I asked if we could pray together and just invite the Holy Spirit to come. And he said, no problem. So uh, we prayed for a few minutes. And then when I asked God to come upon him, he suddenly curled over in the chair and then fell on the ground and began writhing like a snake and just grunting in pain. And uh, his friend was totally surprised as we went through what I would consider a a low-level deliverance that only lasted about 15 minutes, but it mostly had to do with, honestly, uh, demonic sexual bondage. And so when it was done, this man was puzzled. He sat up, got into his chair, and just kind of decompressed. And then he said, I feel lighter. And I thought, I bet you do. Some critters are gone now. So in one of our first small groups, uh, I didn't know anything. I'm leading a small group. It was back in the day, and there was a young woman who would come who would behaviorally act out sometimes in a peculiar ways. Sometimes she would just sing the little worship songs. We'd be singing really loud, and then uh, other times just kind of laugh inappropriately, and sometimes showing up at our house an hour before the small group and just sitting there, sometimes quoting Bible verses and so forth, and Several times I pulled her aside and said, hey, you know, there's some behavioral things here and, you know, you just need to kind of, you know, dial things down a little bit and just relax. And she'd agree and then it would happen again. And one night she got pretty out of control and the rest of the group, you could feel it was really uncomfortable, like what's going on? I didn't know anything then. And I told my wife, you keep leading the group. I'm going to drive her on home because this is not working. So I'm driving down I-71, and she's quiet. We're just driving. And she looks over at me and smiles and says, I'll see you in hell. And that's when my hair stood up, and it's never come back down. But I said, no, that's not going to happen. Things can get weird when you open up the church to the, um, the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. A few weeks ago, I spoke at the uh, church of Vineyard Covington uh, Church and uh, was asked to talk about the kingdom of God. And I told a story about one of the first times that I was an eyewitness to a power encounter uh, and these two kingdoms clashing. And I told them a story of a, it was way back in the day when dinosaurs ruled the earth. And I played in a, I was a musician and played in a uh, Christian rock band back in the day when that was an oxymoron. And I was on the road for several years, starving to death. And my amazing wife supported us for years. You, you know what they call a musician that's not married? Homeless. Uh, she was awesome, and so we were doing this concert in Flagstaff, Arizona, which had a ton of New Age stuff there. It was, it was a fascinating place, and after the concert, we would typically play all our songs, and then one of us, me or the keyboard player, we'd get up and do a little five-minute talk on our own story to invite people to come to know Jesus. And so there's a group of young people that came up on the stage, we had them backstage on the, off to the side, and getting ready to pray for them. And this woman in her mid-30s comes crashing into, this middle, this, into the middle of the circle of teenagers, shouting obscenities, just shouting obscenities and making fun of what she called religion. And these kids, their eyes were as big as saucers. And I, I pulled her aside and asked, hey, what's going on with you? And there was a man with her who stood behind her the entire time, I kid you not, and just smiled. Never said a word, just smiled. And it just was creepy. So she told me she had tried religion before, and it was all but a blankety-blank joke, and she was buzzed on coke at that very moment, so there. And uh, you can take your blankety-blank religion and shove it and blah, blah, blah. So I asked her, I said, can I just pray for you? Because I didn't know what to do and thought that would shut her down for a minute. And she said, you can blankety blank, do whatever the blankety blank you want. And so I just said, God, in the name of Jesus, come and touch this woman. And boom, she hit the floor like a bag of rocks out cold, just out cold. And smiley guy looks at her and looks at me and looks at her. And these kids off to the side, are, I, they're thinking, this is not your average mosh pit. Something more is happening here. And my first thought was, dang, Jesus, you killed her. 
I, this, this is horrible PR for a Christian rock band. Horrible. And so I didn't know what to do. So I'm just praying over her like that's normal. And, you know, and if, it, for about two minutes, this went on, which seems like an eternity when you think someone's dead. And she suddenly jumped to her feet and ran out of the auditorium with smiley guy running behind him. And I'm kind of keeping up a little bit, doing some post-counseling cleanup like, hey, are, do you know any churches in the city? And blah, blah, blah. But she was gone like she had seen a ghost. And I thought, wow, this, this stuff is pretty powerful. Something's going on here. And what I was experiencing in those early days was a, was a clash of kingdoms. There are times in the New Testament where Jesus healed people of physical issues, dysfunctions of different kinds, and other times where there was spiritual oppression hanging on people that could affect people physically and emotionally. And I'm telling you, to the Western rational mindset, this just seems crazy. But Luke, who himself was a physician, this guy was a smart guy, he writes frankly about this. In his gospel, he says, a large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him, Jesus, and to be healed of their diseases. And catch this, those troubled by evil spirits were cured and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. See, there, there's, a, there's a whole spiritual realm out, realm out there that, that, that Western Christians are really, really unaware of. That's why God was very careful to teach Israel back in the Old Covenant to not have anything to do with the, with the occult or with mediums or with seances or anyone who talks to the dead or anyone with casting spells or omens or whatever. God said it was detestable. And what he was doing was protecting them from spiritual realities that are not healthy, that are not good, that are dangerous. And just like we have a hard time in our culture sometimes defining what is moral and what is not, what is pornographic and what is not, is that Rubens painting? Is that pornographic, Right. Imagine how hard it is for, deter for us to determine what is good and bad in the realm of the Spirit. So God was being protective. And while all of these stories can be a little overwhelming and a little mind-bending, spiritual oppression doesn't always have to manifest itself in such dramatic ways. One day, Jesus casually asks his disciples, he says, hey, who do people out there say that I am? They gave him different answers of things that the crowd had been saying about him. And then he says, who do you say I am? And Peter just jumps right in. He says, you are the Messiah. You're the Son of God, the living God. And Jesus, he, he, he congratulates him. He says, way to go, Peter, because you're a blessed man. That was a revelation from God. That, that he, Jesus, would build his revolution, his movement on this planet, on that reality, on that rock. But then, in the very next paragraph in the story, it reads that Jesus began to teach them how he was going to suffer at the hands of religious leaders and be executed. And a very anxious Peter pulls him aside and says to him, don't talk like that, Jesus. That's never going to happen. And Jesus says to him, I don't even want to look at you. Get behind me, Satan. You're only concerned with yourself and your friends. You have no idea what God wants. You're a barrier to my mission. Wow. Peter was, was unwittingly being used by the enemy, being influenced to say something so antithetical to the ways of God. So sometimes depression, anxiety, fearfulness, other emotional and debilitating conditions can be brought on by an oppressive way, in an oppressive way by the enemy and demonic influence. The trick is that with all the possible causes, whether that's chemistry or uh, the effects of destructive behavioral patterns or things that abuse in our past or whether it's spiritual oppression, oppression sometimes those are all interconnected and a, and a little a mesh together. One piece can affect the other. 
I mean, every doctor is aware of how emotional stress can affect us physically, right? You know that. And vice versa. Sometimes when people are healed physically, a common response was, well, that whole thing was probably psychosomatic to begin with. Well, my response is so. You know, whether it's caused by our psychology or our spiritual root or by chemistry, biologically, a healing is a, is a healing. And I believe that God wants to make us whole. The entire ministry of Jesus toward people was about healing and restoration. So let's use every weapon we have at our disposal to help people become whole people. Right? So when it comes to spiritual oppression, let's get prescriptive here, and I'll give you a few ideas, and then uh, we'll be done. First, just remember, just remember that so much spiritual warfare actually takes place up here in, in your gray matter. So the first thing you want to do is to really clarify the character of God and, and how His fathering of you is connected to how much He really loves you. And He crossed, you, you, you are invaluable to God. He crossed a universe to find you and to rescue you, and to fight for you. And if you don't know that, you'll, you'll, if you don't know that, you, you just, all you have to do is just turn to Him. <laughs> turn to Him and ask Him to be your God, to rescue you, to forgive you, make you a new creation in Jesus. Because when Jesus talked about His Father with His disciples, what He was doing was deconstructing uh, their image of God and reconstructing a true narrative of how God really thinks about His creation, right? So when Jesus told His followers not to worry about material things, that, that if they would just simply seek the kingdom of God first in His righteousness, everything that they'll ever need in life would be taken care of. He was hitting at the root of fear and anxiety for us carbon-based bipeds, right? Even talking about God as a father who adored His children was radically different from the religious teachers of the day and probably somewhat today too. So if you had an abusive father or an emotionally absent dad or mom or whatever, don't let the enemy use that as a lens to view your heavenly father because he is everything your dad wasn't. Second thing to try, begin to speak affirmations as to who you are in Christ. You have a new identity now. That, that's a unique form of prayer. It's changing your perception of yourself to align with God's truth about you. So here, here's an exercise for this week. For the next seven days, just monitor what comes out of your mouth. Je Jesus said that out of the fullness of the heart, the uh, mouth speaks. So how much negativity comes out of you? That's an indicator of what's in your gas tank. You know, phrases like, oh, I can't do anything right or I'll never amount to anything, or I'm never going to have anything, or God's mad at me, or nobody likes me, or if God really loved me, this wouldn't have happened, and so forth, and on and on and on. That's got to stop. Or your negativity about how you talk about other people. Listen, listen to what Paul writes in Romans 8. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? In all these things, just a few verses later, it says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Right? So don't let this world or the enemy himself shake you from that truth. Change the way you see yourself in the light of how God sees you. You know, and, and talking about the, the uh, forces that come against you, John writes to the early church, and he says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The Apostle Paul wrote with confidence, even while he was in jail, that he could do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens him because he had discovered his adequacy was in Christ Jesus. In his letter to the church in Rome, he says that we actually are transformed by changing the way we think, by renewing our mind to align with the views of God. So from this day on, change the way you see yourself, the way you think. My mom, who is 94 and now struggling with uh, dementia, but her whole life, even as a Christian and later on in life, she would say regularly, oh, I'm just so dumb. 
Yeah, she never finished. I think tenth grade was it. You know, grew up in, you know, in Kentucky in a very poor setting. And her alcoholic dad, she told me, would always tell her, "You are so dumb. You're just dumb." And she lived with that even in her 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. You think, wow, that's hard. So change the way. The scriptures say that you have the mind of Christ. So I have the mind of Christ. I am a joint heir, inheritance with Jesus. I am accepted in the beloved. I am alive in Christ. I overcome all things that I'm like a tree planted by the water and I bear forth fruit in the season that's right. You just talk to yourself differently. Third thing is learn the art of worship. I'm telling you, you know, if you don't care about singing or you don't care about music or whatever, I get that. But worship is powerful. What the bridge does in the first part of this celebration, it was so awesome. I sat through the first service thinking, man, that's good. The, the, what they do in the first part of your celebration is called worship. And all it is is simply prayers of intimacy with God. And it's put to music. Worship has a unique ability to rout the enemies of your soul. It is an amazing cure for despondency and anxiety. And so learning the art of worship keeps us centered on who's really in charge on this planet. And there's a spiritual principle that's at work here. Back in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, there's a, just a crazy story of a king named Jehoshaphat. He was king of Judah. And uh, they were attacked by this amalgamation of armies. These armies joined together. Their enemies joined together to attack them, and they were super powerful. It was the Ammonites and the Moabites and the Meunites and the Parasites, and the Gophliakites. I'm just seeing if you're listening. That's all. And... Uh, Jehoshaphat just cries out to God and says, we have no power against this large army that's attacking us. We don't know what to do, so we look to you for help. And God basically answers him through a prophet that says, I got this. This isn't your battle. This is mine. So Jehoshaphat gathers some people together, and they come up with this crazy out-of-the-box strategy, and it was this. It says that when he had consulted with the people, He appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who should praise the beauty of His holiness as they went out before the army saying, praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. Now when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they fought against each other and were defeated. Did you catch that? That he put the worship team in front of the army? I mean, what does that tell you? It makes you rethink those music lessons. That's what it does. But you see, learning to worship will turn you into a fighter rather than a passive receiver of life circumstances or the oppression of the enemy. And so when we stand up and we worship a big God, I tell you, the enemy of your soul cannot stand to hear you bragging about God and depending on Him. And He will flee. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, and the enemy cannot stand that name. Last, and then we're done. Never, ever be ashamed to get prayer from a place and the people you trust, like the bridge. We need each other, right? And to confront the enemy who so likes to harass and oppress the body of Christ, especially when we feel weak and under attack. So let's take the authority that God has given us and fight for our brothers and sisters to rebuke the enemy and send him running. The prayer teams back back at our church where I was pastoring, I mean, they I'm sure just like here, they are trained to operate in this stuff. And they would listen carefully to people who had come forward and assess the situation with an ear to the Holy Spirit and then move with authority and power. Never be ashamed to receive prayer. When you're down, when you're depressed, 
whether there's anxiety, whether there's some overt fear, whatever it is, get prayer from the people you trust and the people who will move with power and authority. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm done. There's nothing left on the paper here. So let's pray. Father, you are awesome. You are way beyond anything we can imagine. Your love toward us, God, we, we can't even fathom. We know of nothing like it on the planet. And the love that maybe some of us have felt as a parent towards a kid or towards a grandchild, and you think, where does that come from? That's nothing compared to the love you have for us. So God, I pray right now that you would come in the power of your Holy Spirit in this place. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Come, Lord. Father, we release the power of the Holy Spirit in this room. Holy Spirit, come. So, Father, we take um, authority over anxieties here. Any fear that the enemy has just bruised us with, we take authority over that in the name of Jesus. Depression must go in the name of Jesus. So come, Holy Spirit. So we receive right now, Father, all that you have for us. Come and fill us afresh with the power of your Spirit. Cause us to change the way we see you, the way we see ourselves, God. Mm. Cause worship to arise in our hearts at the times where we feel the most lonely, the most alone, the most hurt. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Lord. And Father, I pray again for any of us who have maybe never taken that first step in knowing you, that God, we would, we would just call out from the depths of our heart to you and say, Jesus, save me, rescue me, make me a new creation. Here's the brokenness of my life. Here's the sin of my life. Here are the things I've done that I'm embarrassed about. I give them to you. In exchange, will you make me a new creation as you've promised? I surrender to you. So, Father, thank you, thank you that in those moments you come immediately into our hearts. So, Jesus, we bless. I bless the people here. Bless with more power, more authority, more love. And thank you for the Bridge Church, God, and the amazing ways you're using this church to change this corner of the world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Prayer team will be down here. And please, don't be shy. You know, you have full permission. Let them pray over you. And there's a five-minute meetup to meet some of the church staff and some of the crew here and ask questions. It's right out in the lobby. God bless you guys. Go home. Go home. See you later.